very pleased to have with us today Dr. Juan Carlos Melgar. He is from the Citrus Center in Kingsville, and he's been there for about seven months. Mm -hmm. But before that, he uh, worked at the University of Florida as a postdoc, mm -hmm. and he's going to show a lot of uh, research results from that research. And before that, he got his degrees from the University of Cordoba in Spain. So I'd say, take it away. Mm -hmm. Thanks first for the invitation and for coming here for listening to, to my talk. Uh, yes, as she was saying, this is mostly research done in Florida because uh, here still is a short time that I'm, that I'm still working here. So, and in Florida I work on stress physio physiology in citrus, especially oriented to well, managing, uh, managing irrigation strategies for trying to solve some problems related with uh, mechanical harvesting and well, increasing water use efficiency and also some things about cold tolerance, as you will see in this, in this talk. So, well, this talk have, has four parts. In the first one, I'll talk about uh, evaluating some deficit irrigation methods. In the second one, how to use or how we were trying to use the fertigation frequency uh, to, um, to manage to, to use it for the relationship between root and shoot growth. The third part that was like a core of my, my research uh, as a postdoc was uh, using drought stress to extend the mechanical harvesting period in the late season cultivars. And I think this is the most interesting part. And then the last part is, uh, is about the relation between drought stress and, and cold tolerance and I mean, in ABA, exogenous ABA applications to, to try to increase the, the freeze tolerance. Well, as introduction, first I want to say that uh, the rainfall in Florida is about a millimeter, it's about 1,200 millimeters. That's uh, about 47 inches per year. And this is the amount that citrus need. This is the, the evapotranspiration of citrus is about that much. So, well, some people may be thinking, then why do we need to irrigate the citrus? There are two factors here. The first one is that we have uh, seasonal, seasonal, or we have seasonal rainfalls there. All the rainfalls happen, in, in, especially in summer, and there is a very dry spring and fall. And on the other side, the, sand, the, the soils are sandy, more than 90% of, uh, of the soil is sand, all sand. So it has a low, a very low water holding capacity. So of course we need supplemental irrigation for this, for growing citrus in these conditions. Uh, in a world in which uh, water is more and more important and there is more competence between industries, tourism, in case of Florida with golf courses and so, population and agriculture, it's every time it's more important to use strategies for safe water. And they, there are some irrigation techniques that can help us in increasing this, uh, increasing the, the amount of water we save in order to improve the water use efficiency. The water use efficiency is the amount of growth or yield that we can get per amount of water we apply. So the most common methods for improving this water use efficiency are two different deficit irrigation methods. The, one of them is a partial root zone drying, also known as PRD, in which PRD, in, in, in PRD what we do is irrigating half of the root zone and leaving dry the other half. There are two kinds of PRD, what it's called fixed PRD, always the same part of the root zone, or what is, has been showed in, in another crops that is more effective, the alternate PRD, alternating after two weeks or after some time of drought in one part, we alternate. No? The other deficit irrigation method that we're going to evaluate here was uh, the regulated deficit irrigation that consists in reducing the, the amount of water we apply uh, in certain periods in which uh, it's not so, so harmful for the trees. Well, these two works that I'm going to present now are done in the greenhouses, uh, are like preliminary 
works, and well, later I can tell you something else about what happened in the field. So the first one was, well, the objective was uh, studying how the physiological and growth responses of uh, one rootstock to these practices, and this was based on what we know from previous works in grape vines and other crops, that these techniques can trigger some signals from the root to the shoots that will induce the stomatal closure, reduce water loss, and increase water use efficiency. For par partial root zone drying, we divided, we split the root, the root zone in, in two and established in adjacent pots. So like, something like in this, in this picture, half of, the, half of the root were here, the other half here. And we had three different treatments. In the first one, we have 100% of the irrigation of the evapotranspiration needs. Uh, then we have the PRD and another one in which we applied 50% of the irrigation needs. And then the way we, do, we did was uh, with 50% and 50% in each part of a pot, in each pot, only 50% in one plant and nothing in the other one, or 25 and 25 for the 50. And when we analyzed the growth parameters, well, what we first saw was that uh, PRD and control behave very similarly for all these growth parameters, leaf dry weight, root dry weight, root length, shoot root ratio, and total plant dry weight. However, of course, the 50%, uh, the, irrigation, the treatment with 50% of uh, irrigation need showed a lower um, root length and leaf dry weight. But however, PRD didn't show any growth reduction. When we analyze some of the gas exchange parameters, uh, this is uh, a simulation of CO2, photosynthesis, photosynthesis, stomatal conductance, water use efficiency of the leaf, and um, whole plant water use efficiency, and also well, total water consumed, we saw again that the, the PRD and control didn't show, the PRD didn't show dif significant differences respect to the control. However, the 50% show a lower photosynthesis and lower water efficiency of the leaf. However, what we could see for the PRD is that the total water consumed was much lower than the, for the control. Also, we analyzed the acetic acid levels concentrations in the leaf, and of course, we saw that the, the, this is a signal that we are receiving from the shoots, uh, ABA in the PRD leaves were, was higher than for controls and the 50% treatment. On the other side, about the regulated deficit irrigation, we had uh, treatments, we have three treatments, the control, 75% and 50%, and this is what we were expecting. It was just uh, for seeing if uh, we get the same results, no? Where is it? Here it is. Uh, of course, decreasing the amount of water, oops. Hmm. Okay. Decreasing the amount of water, decrease the leaf dry weight, root length, total plant dry weight, and also root dry weight. When we analyzed, the, when we mm, performed the gas exchange uh, measurements, we also saw that the plants with lower amount of water had very low photosynthesis, uh, water use efficiency. Of course, we decreased uh, the, the total water consumed, but also the, the water use efficiency in the, in the whole plant was decreased. So, and uh, well, uh, we also saw that the ABA, of course, well, it doesn't, it doesn't have any importance, no? but the ABA concentration in the leaf of the 50% treatment was uh, much higher. So our conclusion was that PRD was able to save a, an important amount of water without reducing uh, growth or altering any gas exchange parameters. However, regulated deficit irrigation can affect the, can affect the growth. What happened after that? Well, I already <laughs> left from there and there was a, a graduate student that was doing her thesis with these experiments in the field. And well, it happened that those two years were probably not the best ones, but th those are the conditions they have in Florida. It rained a lot. And it's hard to have a PRD <laughs> irrigate half of a, 
I mean, maintain half of the root zone without water, just shutting off the irrigation because it rained. So of course they, they save water, but however, they couldn't, they couldn't show these concentrations of ABA. Well, I maybe have skipped that part, but since the roots are under drought stress, that, that, that half of the root, those roots are the ones that are sending that ABA to the shoot that are the signal for closing this stomata. So if uh, you don't keep that stress, stomata are gonna, not gonna close, you are not gonna save so much water, no? Uh, still, even though they apply less water, but they couldn't get the PRD fully working. Maybe for a dry year, it's a good, it's a good thing in, for citrus in Florida, but of course this has been working, it has been proved that it, it works in many other crops, but in those conditions in the field, it depends on the year. Uh, probably here it works, but there with those, those heavy rains, when it rains, uh, it didn't work. On the other side, uh, we established another experiment, and I was talking to you um, to ask Astrid that it didn't work as we were expecting, but anyway, I think it's interesting to show, it's kind of short also. Uh, you may have heard about the um, HLB, the greening disease. It's a psyllid that transmits this, uh, this bacteria, and the psyllid feeds normally, well in Florida you have two types of uh, shoots, vegetative shoots, in spring and in summer. In the conditions in Florida, uh, this psyllid feeds especially in the, the summer flush. So we were wondering what about if we can manage the irrigation, managing the fertigation, irrigation and, and fer fertilizer application to try to control, to decrease that summer flush. So that was our, our idea our, for, for first these uh, experiments in the greenhouse. Initially what we did was uh, with, well, three treatments in which we applied always the same amount of water, but in a different, with three different times. So for example, in this one, we applied 15 millimeters per day with 10 pulses. It was like 1.5 mils every, every hour. In this one, we applied only one pulse. I mean, we, we measured 15 mils and applied at once. And in this one, we applied 45 mils every three days. So all the plants were having the same, the same amount of water. We were weighting the plants every day, so we measured how much water they were losing. And we saw that the plants with the lowest irrigation frequency, that is 10 pulses per day, no, no, this one, one pulse every three, day, three days, were losing less water. This is a daily, Evapotranspiration, these ones are transpirating or evapotranspirating more, more water. So these ones were having the highest water use efficiency. Of course, well, here we think that this was as a consequence of, uh, there was a lot of evapor evaporation, more than transpiration, evaporation from the soil because it was just 1.5 mils every hour. So that 1.5, I mean, a, a big amount of that, of that, it's being evaporated. We also measure here the, the growth, especially root, well, root growth and shoot growth and, and total plant dry weight. And we saw that the plant with 10 pulses, the roots were growing the less, and, well, and, and also the, the shoot. So we got a lower total plant dry weight. And then here we, we thought, okay, let's work also with uh, different fertilizer uh, frequencies. What happens if other than the water, we also apply the, free, the fertilizer to, with different frequencies? So we have two treatments, daily water or every three days, but for daily water, we applied fertilizer also daily or every two weeks. And for every three days, when we applied water every three days, we applied the fertilizer every three days or every two weeks, the same. And what we observed was something similar is that the fertigating daily were losing, these plants were losing much, water, much more water than plants that were watered every three days and fertilized every two weeks. And not only that, also that the amount of nitrogen, the concentration of leaf nitrogen was higher for these plants. So even though you are applying the same, the, the pattern that you can observe is different. 
And here, the only difference is that we observe in root, were in root growth, and was that plants, plants that were being fertilized every two weeks were showing a lower root dry weight. That was the opposite that we were trying because, well, we didn't found we didn't find any any differences in shoot growth. So we were looking for having lower shoot growth and and not root growth. Uh, but still, we consider that it's interesting and further studies can be done because managing actually you can see some effects in, in, in at least in in root growth. No. Okay, it's the same. About the third part, uh, well, that's, this was using drought stress to extend the mechanical harvesting. What's the problem here? Okay, first of all, I want to tell you that mechanical harvesting, well, still in Florida, is something like 7% of the, of the whole acreage. It's still little, but it's increasing every year. There are two methods of uh, harvesting, mechanical harvesting. And it's the trunk shaker that it works. Uh, whoops, I think I have to click there. No? You probably have seen all these methods. Uh, mm, oh no, that needs. I have to upload the video here. I think. Okay. Mm, well, I can show it to you later. <laughs> anyway, one of them is uh, the trunk shaker that just shake the trunk. The other one, the canopy shaker, it has like. A, this machine, they are like fingers, and they go into the tree, and the machine, when it's going ahead, it's just shaking the canopy, no? and all the, it, 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 it shows less damages than the trunk shaker. Okay, and the problem is that in late season cultivars like Valencia, you have at the same time, I mean, these cultivars are being harvested in May, yeah, may even it could be even at the beginning of June, and, and by that time you also have, you have of course the fruit that you want to harvest, but you also have the fruitlet that is going to be next year crop. So when you harvest mechanical harvest the tree, when you shake it, this fruit will drop, but also this one. So you are losing next year's crop. Uh, for that, our well, this happens if uh, these fruits are lar large enough, something like uh, one inch in diameter. What we thought was that if we can delay flowering, even if it's only two or three weeks, these fruits would be, these fruitlets would be smaller, and if they are smaller, they are more attached to the tree. So we thought in applying drought stress in order to delay the flowering. What we do was like uh, during 100 days from December, mid of December till mid of uh, March, we applied this rain out ground covers to avoid the, ra the rains. We had three treatments, uh, this one with uh, covers, another one with only rain, and another one with rain plus irrigation, the control. And after these three months, well, a well-irrigated tree, tree would look like this with all the flowers. A drought stress tree at the same day, the same time, the same, it looked like that. It was really, really drought stress. I mean, the first year, we were saying, we have to start irrigating now or we will lose them. <laughs> um, you can see also here the differences, all these trees blooming, and this is completely without flowers. When we measured the stem water potential for measuring how, estimating how stressed they were, well, uh, by March, this drought stress treatment reached three, mm, minus three megapascal. That's a, a lot. I mean, it's very low. While the well irrigated trees were about, in, about one. And what we saw, well, these trees also flowered. They bloom. And, but it happened two, some years, two weeks. Some years, three weeks later. We got less number of flowers. This is the number of flowers per tree. In the, day, in, the, in the different dates. So we got a lower number of flowers and like two, three weeks later. But however, later we counted also the, the fruit sets. I mean, we counted how many of the fruitlets, uh, how, how much was a fruitlet, the fruit set. And we got similar yields. And that was because of 
it's important if uh, the inflorescence have the number of leaves that there is in the, in the shoot where the inflorescence have, uh, is. For example, the rain plus irrigation, the control, had an average of six leaves per flower, whereas the drought stress has a, an average of uh, 13 leaves per flower. This was what is called a leafy shoot. So it was kind of a compensation because many of those flowers, I mean, they cannot be, that the leaves cannot supply so many carbohydrates for those when they have so many flowers. So if there is only one flower, they receive all these carbohydrates from the leaves, if this is a leafy, if this is a leafy shoot. So there is kind of a compensation uh, among those uh, shoots and those shoots that had, that had less number of flowers, the fruit set was higher than those shoots that were having an initially more flowers. So this is one, one month later, we have fruitlets of this size, and at the same time, the drought, uh, drought stress trees showed fruitless of this size. Then another problem, another measurement, measurement that we needed to do came to our mind. It's like, okay, if they are going to be delayed, what's gonna happen next year? Are they gonna catch up, or are they gonna be smaller in size? But not also because of they have a number a lower number of fruitlets, it happened this, that by September, this was a fruit size in the three different treatments, and by September, the, September there were not different, significant differences between the treatments. Then we keep going with uh, the actual, I mean, these were those fruitlets, no? The next year in April, we measured fruit quality, fruit juice, uh, fruit, Juice percentage, fruit size, uh, all the bricks acidity and bricks acidity ratio. And, okay, I'm not showing the data here, but it's published, and there were no differences between these treatments. And this happens for three years, between 2007 and 2000, starting in 2006, December, until 2009. So we, we consider that this is a technique that we can apply for not losing the crop, because uh, the most important thing is the more the more, the most uh, shocking picture maybe is this one that we can, you can see now in a well irrigated tree in which all those fruitlets at the harvesting time have this size. We were, we were harvesting one of these boxes. I mean, that was almost a whole <laughs> crop next year. Whereas in a drought stress tree, we were harvesting this, a little amount of uh, green fruits. Actually, yeah, these are the data. It was 13 kilos versus 2.5 kilos, no? So it was a, and also in the diameter, it was a big difference. So the conclusion is that the winter time drought stress can, can really be effective uh, for delaying the water, the flowering time. Again, we got like two, three weeks in the three years without losing mm, quality in the juice or, or the fruit. And the last experiment that I want to show you is, um, is about, well, taking advantage that we were stressing these trees and from some of the works that we read that applying exogenous ABA could help in, in increasing the freeze, freeze tolerant, tolerance. Well, first of all, that freezing for citrus is the most important limitation in, in the world. Uh, and well, as I was saying before, since you know that ABA acts as a root signal, uh, but it's ABA is also involved in the cold tolerant responses. So we thought, what about if we take advantage of these trees and apply this exogenous ABA and see if we can see any, any differences. So we did in, this, in the same two irrigation regimes, uh, drought stress and well irrigated trees. Uh, we applied one millimolar of ABA to some of the branches. I don't know if maybe some people see us uh, to this um, kind of measurement, how to measure freeze tolerance. What we do was uh, taking leaf disks 
and we put them into a test tube. And these test tubes go into a refrigerated water bath with temperatures between 26 and 16 Fahrenheit. And then we measure these temperatures are supposed to break the membranes from the cells, so many of the solutes go outside. No? We measure the electrical conductivity of these leaf discs in, a, in water. No? And then we put them into the, of course, a cooler temperature, more solutes there will be here. We put them into an autoclave to break all the membranes because some, well, if we compare different cultivars, they have a different, they can show differences in here, no? So we need to know how much is all the solutes. We break all the membranes after 20 minutes in the autoclave and we calculate the ratio between the initial amount of solutes and the final amount of solutes. That ratio gives us what is called the electrolyte leakage, that is initial divided by final, and we plot the electrolyte leakage with the temperature and we usually get this kind of course, sigmoidal curve. And well, in many other crops, it has been observed that the, I mean, it's considered that the lethal freezing temperature is the LT50, that is where the inflection point is. No? This is the way that we can say, well, these trees or these species, is at, it has a freezing tolerance of 20. No? And what we saw is that, okay, these are our four treatments, drought, without ABA, drought plus ABA, exogenous ABA, control rain plus irrigation, without and with ABA. And in the first week after applying the exogenous ABA, we saw that the branches, the leaves that got the exogenous ABA, but they were also under drought stress, showed a four degrees lower freeze tolerance than the other treatments. However, when we measure during the third week, uh, there wasn't any interaction, there was no effect of ABA, and the only effect was uh, at very, very little, and it was one, almost two degrees, of the water, water status. No? So it seems that ABA can improve the freeze tolerance, but only right after, uh, after the application. Well, this is probably something that the, the farmers, the growers, cannot apply ABA like this because this is expensive. I know that there are some people that are doing it, um, putting the ABA in the irrigation. So since also ABA is a signal, a hormone that can be synthesized by the roots and sent to the shoots, it's like making it also available already at the roots. I haven't tried with citrus in roots, but it, it may be interesting. And at least to know if uh, it's having any effect. No? So, well, the conclusion already, already says that both drought stress and exogenous ABA can have an effect in, in decreasing freeze tolerance. And well, that was all that story. Now I'm moving in the Rio Grande Valley, and even though I'm starting with some research, actually freezing, late freezes are one of the most interesting for, for the growers in the area. And we have started, we are, we have been, in the last month we have been testing some cultivars, transgenic cultivars that are being developed in, in there. And it's part of, uh, of, of the work that I'm, I'm doing now. Uh, I'm coming from the Citrus Center that it has uh, new facilities in case you, anytime you have to, the you have chance to, to go there, you can, you can visit us. And this is all what I wanted to talk. Yeah. Hope you like it, and if you have any, any question. Did you say that the, the drought stressed mature citrus had the same sugar content as the non drought stressed? Uh, in the fruits. Fruits, right. Normally it has higher. But what we, we, we didn't see any differences. The thing is that after that period of 100 days, we resumed the irrigation. Oh, okay. So if not, the tree dies. No? So we removed the Tyvex. And resuming the irrigation in it was March, in the middle of March. Then it will not affect the next year crop because I mean it's just a delay in flowering. So those flowers when they bloom and fruit is set, those fruits will will have irrigation. But normally you would expect that if you had a drought stress, yes. you would have higher sugars. Yes, higher sugars.
But since all these fruits were growing with water, there were no differences. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, I put a picture of uh, shoots. Uh, if it's a late freeze, well, it, it can affect also the fruit. Mm -hmm. I mean, the picture was just uh, like introduction showing showing one of the effects of the freezes. Yeah, but those, those cutoff temperatures is for the tree itself. Not yes. The, the fruit's more sensitive to cold. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then on the drought, the, the question about drought itself providing more cold tolerance. Uh -huh. is, that, is that why California citrus is more cold-hardy? You know, they have well, to freeze with the same temperature, and the trees are not even damaged. Well, in this case, uh, drought is, uh, I mean, our hypothesis is that drought stress is helping in synthesizing this. These trees are are able to synthesize this ABA that will help in, in for the cold tolerance. Of course, well, one of the techniques that growers apply when uh, freezing is coming is just watering. That that has another effect, no? This is for for the heating that the heat that you get when the water freezes. No? Uh, but this is a physiological part that those trees and the drought stress that are producing ABA. Can can be yeah can can have a a lower temperature can can hold a, a lower lower temperature. So in a dry climate, like a desert climate like California, would you expect it, if you measure the ABA, would it be higher than leaves at the same cold uh, It's well, if it's not if it's irrigated. I mean, if it's not irrigated, I I think so. If if it's not irrigated at that time. No? I mean, it could be conditions can be dry. In Florida, also, it doesn't rain during during winter, so conditions are dry. But if uh, in Florida, everybody irrigates the tree in winter. So drought is not the only factor affecting cold hardiness. No, I mean, well, also, well, the cold hardiness that the trees can, you know, the temperatures. Uh, well, citrus is, has not a dormancy period, has not vernalization. But of course, it's, uh, there is this cold hardiness that low temperatures, not freezing temperatures, but low temperatures during the winter can help uh, in making the, those trees more cold hardened when the freeze, uh, the freeze comes. Uh, it's like when, when you have a plant in the greenhouse and a plant outside that has been exposed to some cold temperatures, not freezes again, and then if you bring that plant from the greenhouse and put it outside, if there is a freeze, of course, those that have been acclimate, acclimated, hardened during the winter will, will, will make better than the plant that is just from the greenhouse. No? Mm -hmm. Yes? A couple of questions. Uh, first, of all, I'd like to know if uh, you know of any grower that adopted this uh, pre-harvest drought and uh, has it been uh -huh. Well, uh, not many growers are harvesting with. Uh, uh -huh. So not yet. So far, I mean, I don't know anyone. Uh, we just published this in last year, and but it's still something that we have done these talks uh, to growers, and growers know the know it. Also, one of the problems, and I was talking. I oh, know it was uh, with another person. One of the problems uh, is that many of the growers are waiting for a chemical abscission chemical compound to be ready to use. Right now, the university is uh, in the process of patenting one. Uh, and actually, I've seen, and it works. I mean, they applied, and three, years, three days later, when they go with the machine, I mean, even if you just touch the orange, <laughs> it will fall. So they are like looking forward to those products are ready to start with mechanical harvesting. I mean, that will be, that will make a difference in mechanical harvesting. For sure, they will start doing it at a higher level. No? Because if, if not, they need more time, and that's also money. I mean, they need more time in machines. Machines are not, are not cheap. So 
once that technology is available, and I think they were already, I mean, I guess it, I think it's going to be the next year or in a couple of years, for sure that they will start at a higher percentage, higher acreage. My other question, and then I, I just came up with another one. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to it, but one is a simple question. What type of substrate were you using for this uh, potted split root experiment? Sand. Like just sand. sand. Yeah, we went to the field, take that sand, but stir it from the field. Sterilize that, that sand and only that, only that sand. And uh, if, there's, if there's not another question, I'd like to know what type of, consider that you're, you're new in your position, what type of uh, uh, advices or, or uh, interest did you find on behalf of the, the citrus industry? Uh -huh. You moving in from Florida, what what do you think, what type of expectations do they have? What type of research would they like to okay. do? The Here first is the same that in Florida, even though there is a big difference, is HLB, greening. In Florida right now, most of the money goes for greening. And here the main worry of all the growers is greening. We don't have greening here yet. Uh, we have the silic. Uh, this year the population, for example, are much lower than the previous year years. Uh, but there is this concern that we have the silid and maybe sometime we will get the, the disease. No? So, well, right now, um, again, I'm starting, but some of the collaborations that we are trying to, uh, to put in on the table is that, well, we have some transgenic, Dr. Luzada has some transgenic cultivars that seems that they are tolerant to some of these environmental stresses and to some diseases, and we want to try what happened what happen with, the, with the silids. Uh, should import some, some contaminated trees. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if, you wanna, if we want to do some research with uh, HLB infected, infected plants, we have to go to Florida. We cannot, yeah. we cannot bring a tree even, yeah, even if it's under control condition, conditions. It has to be there, no? Uh, and with the silids, there is a lot to do because even, well, different, for example, different cultivars had different volatiles and some silids can be attracted to these volatiles or not. Uh, some even different conditions, irrigation conditions, can increase some of these volatiles. So there is a lot of field to, to do. But of course, the main worry is, even though we don't have greening, do some works. Growers have money for, for works uh, on greening. Yeah, well, there is something important I forgot to say. I think it's related to what, what you are asking. Is that another thing that the growers cannot do is spending money in these Tyvek covers, covering the field with uh, these, not plastic, but these covers. No? We were thinking, and I think that they, now they are doing some of uh, these projects, in using natural covers, kind of um, peanut, peanuts, very common there in, in Florida. So they can, I mean, you cannot avoid the rain, but you can increase the removal of water, no? So that's the idea of uh, using, shutting off irrigation, of course, and using, using natural covers for, for increasing the can drought you stress. Ask, uh, a home to sponsor? <laughs> 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 My question was, Uh -huh. But if you're going to do the similar things in, in California, they are looking at the size of the fruit. Yes. Did you, did you find any big difference? No, no, that's the thing that since uh, the fruit, is, I mean, the tree is being irrigated since uh, flowering, I mean, since March, the middle of March. So that fruit will grow normally, a little bit delayed, but at the end, at the end it will, not at the end, at the middle of the year, it will catch up with the other ones. Uh, the only thing is that. Yeah, it's just that delay. 
Any other thing is, uh, is the same, same fruit size, same fruit per, uh, juice percentage, and same qualities in the juice, what we measure, bricks and acidity. So it, during the three years, we didn't, we didn't find any, any difference. And there were not, and that's important too, there were no differences in, because in that map that, that, map that I show you, uh, okay, some of those trees that were covered, what we did was, that was first year. The second year, we used, I mean, we have 10 trees, we used five of them, again covered, and five of them not covered. We went to, we moved the, the treatment, no? In order to have, and the third year also the same, the same trees that were covered the first and second year, these five trees were covered there, and the other one, we alternate with the purpose of, is there, to know if, is there any effect, like long-term effect of drought stressing the same trees? But again, nothing. It was, it was not, not effect of, a long-term, three years effect. In the core tolerance experiment, did you link the drug effect on the proline content and the core tolerance? Uh, there were some things that I couldn't measure because that was at the end of my period. One of them was uh, proline. I also wanted to have measured the antioxidant enzymes. And we only did it for one year. And the next, the following year, once I was already in, in Spain, back in Spain, they tried to do it, but they, it didn't work. It didn't work because they messed up with a, they bought another EVA, not the cis trans, but only. <laughs> so it has another concentration. They were sure that they were doing what, the same that I did the previous year, but it didn't work. We have, to, we have to do it somewhere, even though, some way, even though they are in Florida, I'm in here, but I think it's interesting to, to test. I like your question. Are you getting pushed by the industry to do physiological aspects? as well as the post-harvest aspect by the same person there? Uh, well, there is something else. In the new I, was, I was talking this morning with, na with somebody about nitrogen, not with you, no? Oh, with you. No, it was with uh, Dr. Yes. Um, there is one more thing that in my previous works in Spain that I work with olive trees, uh, and I presented this idea to the growers here and they actually find that it was, it's just plant physiology and nothing to do with, uh, with HLV, but anyway. Mm, it's also related with cold tolerance. Okay, related with cold tolerance and nitrogen applications. When a tree is under excess, at least it happens in olive trees, under excess, mm, if it's under deficiency, nitrogen deficiency, that tree is more cold sensible, more sensitive, no? It's not cold, as cold tolerance as if it has adequate level of nitrogen. But it, it has been seen that in some species, among them is uh, olive trees, if it's under excess, and in Spain it's very common to apply nitrogen in excess, just in case the tree needed, I mean, they, did, they do a, a leaf analysis, the tree is okay, but I apply by calendar nitrogen. And there have been problems also in contaminations of aquifers and all these. Uh, but still people is applying in excess. And it has been seen that for late freezes, if the tree has excess of nitrogen, it could be mm, bad for, I mean, it has a lower tolerance. So I wanted to do this in, in citrus. And well, they gave me $5,000 for buying a equipment, a water bath and all that. So they are also interested in all these things. Even though their main thing is uh, the, HLV, the greening, but still all, everything, anything related with cold tolerance is important in the valley. Mm -hmm.